Good morning and happy Sabbath, friends. Today is December 4, 2020, and I'm recording this for upload. For December 5, 2020, I'm recording from my home. And uh, we here in Sacramento are in a county-wide stay-at-home order. We will be having church tomorrow. We will be holding an outdoor service tomorrow. And we'll be in the courtyard, so bring your warm blankets and your chairs. And we look forward to seeing you there. And I invite you to bow your heads with me as we have a word of prayer before we begin our Bible study. Loving God in heaven, you know me, you know more than ever that I need this word uh, as much as anyone else in our congregation. And I pray now that you would um, calm my spirit. May there be no technical difficulties. May I be able to present your word as you would have it through your Holy Spirit, dear Lord. I pray that I'm a sinful person in need of your grace. And I ask for your forgiveness to open your word today. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. You know, we all use batteries. We have batteries in our laptops, our phones, our devices, and batteries are a power source. Yet we know how fast those power sources get depleted, especially when we need them and we can't use them. But you know, friends, the love of God is a never ending power source that we can draw on all the time. It's not an easy thing. We are experiencing COVID fatigue. Many of us, I know I am. I, uh, you know, for selfish reasons, want life to get back to normal. But, you know, as I pondered that phenomenon of COVID fatigue and what's happening in our generation now, I'm surprised that there's not more of the fatigue of this world fatigue of sin, the fatigue of the enemy of God, always tempting us. And, and I'm tired of fighting the temptation. I'm tired of leaning on God all the time. I know that's, that's you know, something we got to do, but I just want to go home. I'm done. I'm, I'm done. I'm tapped out. I'm tired of the funerals and the sickness and the broken relationships and the boundaries and the barriers that exist, even among those who are within God's invisible kingdom. And so today I hope to bring you a word of encouragement. And my main idea for today's sermon in, in, entitled Much More, and I'll bring up the screen here as I give the main idea. The main idea of today's sermon is that obedience is faith energized by love. Obedience is faith that is energized by love and is based on Romans 5, 10, and 11. You see, in this part of the book of Romans, Paul is talking uh, to the Christians in Rome as believers who understand the gospel in the context of the Hebrew sanctuary. And he uses that language, especially in the book of Hebrews. All throughout the New Testament, he uses the language the sanctuary to help us understand the gospel. He says here in Romans 5, 10 and 11, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. This reconciliation act that God gives us is what we understand as justification in the Protestant nomenclature. We understand, you know, to simplify it, we relate to God just as if we had never sinned. Now, that's a powerful, powerful sentiment, but I hope to draw that out for you today through a story in the gospel, through these verses in the Romans, and through the book that I've been going through for this sermon series known as The Compelling Love of God. Uh, it's uh, blanking out there. Okay, it's, I'm holding it close. This book uh, by Clinton Meharry, I purchased. But all of these, all of the content in this book can be freely available from compellinglove.org. I encourage you to go to that website and check out some of the resources there. There are many amazing 
documents and appendixes there that can uh, help us, you know, draw on this concept much, much more. You see, in the Gospel of Luke, there was a Sabbath in a synagogue where Jesus ran into this tension because within the synagogue, within Judaism, they still misunderstood salvation, even though they had the temple and the Old Testament and the writings. They still misunderstood. And so in Luke chapter 13, verses 10 through 17, hopefully this story can help us to understand more about the love of God and his tremendous grace to us. You see, this woman had come to the sanctuary for healing. We have protocols in place in our sanctuary to keep people well and to keep people healthy at this time during the global pandemic. And a lot of people choose to stay away for health reasons, but this woman came to church in her firm condition, wanting healing. Beginning in verse 10, and he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And there was a woman who for 18 years had had a sickness caused by a spirit, and she was bent double and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called over and, and called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your sickness. And he laid his hands on her. Immediately, she was made erect again and began glorifying God. But the synagogue official, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, began saying to the crowd in response, there are six days in which work should be done. So come during them and get healed and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to water him? And this woman, a daughter of Abraham as she is, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, should she not have been released from this bond on the Sabbath day? And he said, as he said this, all his opponents were being humiliated, and the entire crowd was rejoicing over all the glorious things being done by him. The woman and her infirmity is the symbol of all of the sin that binds us. And Jesus stated it so clearly. It's a result of the great controversy and the curse that we endure. That we're in this agony of this world. You know, we search for normal and we search for things to be as comfortable as possible, but they will never be in this earth. They will never be in this world until we're glorified at the second coming of Jesus and we're raised immortal. With everlasting life. There will be this challenge of sin, this infirmity. But Jesus's message to the young woman, the, the woman, can't, can't call her young as her malady was 18 years. This woman was touched by Jesus. This woman was encouraged by Jesus. This woman was told that she is a daughter of Abraham. An inheritance was secured for her in that phrase. This is in the Perean ministry in AD 31 at the close of his ministry. The Pharisees and Sadducees at this point are at the height of their opposition against him, and they had made a pact to take him out. Yet this woman and her deformity would have been seen not as something to be empathized with, but as a hand of God. You see, whoever had come into the synagogue with a malady was seen to be stricken with the curse of God. What a tremendously wrong paradigm of world, and what a judgmental picture or outlook of people. You know, these days, there's a lot of virtual signaling going on, and there's a lot of cancel culture going on. Is it rightly motivated? Is the judgments that we place on our fellow man based on pure motives? I submit to you that it is not. And for the things that we do, every act of judgment that we carry out is acting on the part of the false teachings of the enemy of God. You see, these 
people would put boundaries to God where there should be no barriers to God. God has removed every barrier between himself and his creatures, especially in the life of Christ Jesus, in the form of Jesus Christ. You see, that spirit of infirmity that had bowed her over is an allusion to the permission that the devil has to cripple us in our sins. The permission that only God can give the devil. Sin bows us down. Sin borrow, bows us down and borrow, sorrow borrow, bows us down. Excuse me, sorrow bows us down as well as sin. Suffering bows us down. We genuflect over the things that beset us, the trials, the, the tests that beset us. But God raises us up and redeems us for the sake of his loving kindness. Isn't that good news? You see, the problems that we face and the things that we go through on a daily basis are not unknown to God. Just as he knew this very woman's malady, do you think it would have been popular knowledge that this woman would have been infirm? But look at how Jesus points to her. He says, Satan bound her for 18 long years. How long have we been bound by an enemy? By a sin that has beset us, by something that we have not given over to the Lord. If you don't think that Jesus understands your pain, remember this story. Remember that God's power is as strong today as it was when Jesus healed this woman and raised her up, and restored her into the community. F.F. Bruce in his amazing book, you see, obedience is faith energized by love. Obedience is faith energized by love. And F.F. Bruce, in his book, Apostle of the Heart Set Free, he quotes John Calvin and he says, Christ is much more powerful than save to save than Adam was to ruin. Christ is much more powerful to save than Adam was to ruin. These two comparisons that John Calvin makes are important for us to understand, especially as we've evaluated already in Romans chapter 5. You see Adam and Christ are positioned on one side of salvation and the other. On one side is Adam, the guilty Adam, who was cursed at the outset and who's set upon in this world with besetments of sin. It wasn't even one generation between both sons were lost to him through sin. And so in Romans 5, 1 through 11, we see the contrast between Adam and Christ, beginning with Romans 5, 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exalt in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings forth perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character hope, and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were still enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. And then he goes on to talk about how just as through Adam, sin entered the world and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because of Adam, because all sinned. And then it talks about in verse 15, the free gift is not like the transgression. For by the transgression of, the, of Adam, many died. Much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. For if by the one transgression, death reigned 
through the one, much more. Those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. These evaluative, qualitative staircase statements that Paul makes in Romans 5 about the much more culminates and finds its fulfillment in verses 20 and 21. The law came in so that he, so, excuse me, so that the transgression would increase. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. These concepts of abundance, these concepts of full assurance of faith, these concepts that help us understand Jesus' commitment to us should set us free. Yet we go back and back each time we go back. But I want to just evaluate this. And Warren Wiersbe has a wonderful outline in Romans 5. You see, based on Jesus' work compared with Adam, we have peace with God. That's a tremendous thing to claim. Peace with God. We want peace with God. Peace with God means that our problem with sin has been settled by the blood of Christ. God is our father, not our judge. And that's what it means to say that we have peace with God. Secondly, we have access to God in verse, verses 2 and A. We have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. We have access to God. That's something that enemy does not want you to realize, dear friend. He wants to create a boundary and a barrier just like that Pharisee did in the synagogue. Woe be it for me. Please forgive me if I have ever put any type of boundary or barrier between you and God. That's not my intention. You can go directly to our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary, Jesus Christ, who ever lives to intercede for us. We have peace. We have access to God. We have hope based on verse 2, in which we exult in hope of the glory of God. And in, in, in the next phase, this actually compares the hope that we have. I don't want to forget this. This hope that we have is compared in Ephesians 2, 13 through 16. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 through 16. Begins by saying, but now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Remember, excuse me, for he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man. Thus establishing peace and might reconcile them both in one body to Christ through the cross by it having put to death the enmity. That hope, that peace, that access to God is based on our identity in him. Not only that, we have daily confidence. In Romans 5, 3, and 4, we have daily confidence coming to God for our daily bread says in verses 3 and 4 in Romans 5, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope, and hope does not disappoint. Excuse me, I, I read wrong there. Verses 3 and 4, and not only this, but we exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope, is the culmination of the tests. So we have peace, we have hope, we have daily confidence, based on the verses I just read, and that's compared also with James 1, 3 and following, and based on verses 5 through 11, as I read, we have the experience of the love of God. How long has it been since you experienced that love of God, that compelling love of God? It's time to re-examine that again and search for it again. God promises to give it to us. It's ours, based on his promises. Here's a quote from, from Warren Wearsby commenting on Romans 5, 5 through 11. The spirit within sheds God's love to us and through us. God revealed his love at the cross when Christ died for those who were without strength, who were ungodly sinners and enemies, thus proving his great love. 
Paul's argument is this. If God did all that for us while we were his enemies, how much more will he do for us now that we are his children? We're saved by Christ's death, but we're also saved by his life as the power of his resurrection operates in our lives. We have received reconciliation, atonement, and now the love of God is experienced in our lives. That's commentary in Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. See, Paul says it right there, but God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What a wonderful, powerful example of the character of our God. You see, if we believe Satan's lies, we will be tempted to turn away from God. He would lead us into more pain and brokenness and in his attempt to destroy us. Every human being is either in Adam or in Christ. Either lost or saved. There's no middle ground. There's no limbo. And so, friends, as you watch this today, as you celebrate the Sabbath, as you consider the various workings of your life, various things that beset you, I hope you can take comfort from this today. And I want to leave you with a quote from Ellen White in Desire of Ages, page 466, speaking about this concept, true We have no power to free ourselves from Satan's control, but when we desire to be set free from sin and in our great need cry out for a power out of and above ourselves, the powers of the soul are imbued with the divine energy of the Holy Spirit. And they obey the dictates of the will in fulfillment, in fulfilling the will of God. The only condition upon which the freedom of man is possible is that of becoming one with Christ. The truth shall make you free, and Christ is the truth. Sin can triumph only by enfeebling the mind and destroying the liberty of the soul. Subjection to God is restoration to oneself, to the true glory and dignity of man. Wow. James 2.12 says, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. You see, I, I want to emphasize the main idea again and then propose a contrary idea. You see, obedience is faith energized by love, but works is belief energized by fear. And this may be the status of some of our relationships with God. They were motivated by fear rather than by an energetic love that emboldens our faith. I know it's very hard with children to appeal to them with love and tenderness and kindness and still be disobeyed. Your natural tendencies is to use fear. If you don't do this, then this will happen. It's a constant tension in which I live with my children, my my family. I pray every day. I ask your prayers as well. That I would have wisdom and patience and knowledge to know how to lead my children in the godly character that he has led us over these many generations and years. You see, there are things that we can do in practical terms. Not in a checklist sort of way, but just consider these concepts. These come from Dr. Stephen Vitrano. Number one, begin the day in Christ and set your mind on the things of the Spirit. Start your day with prayer, faithful Bible study, whether it's alone or even with the group. But get that daily bread, get that daily meat. To also, number two, throughout the day, grow in the knowledge of God's will and learn how to cooperate with Him when dealing with temptation. Speak to Him as you would to a friend. Never neglect the privilege of prayer. Remember when you want to complain. Complain to God first before picking up the phone and calling someone who you may trust, but who may still understand your complaint in a different way than God would. Number three, at the end of the day, accept God's forgiveness. As you reflect on the day's events, take your burdens and cares to him, knowing that he is powerful to loose you of your infirmities and forgive your sins. 
that how that's how it's helpful to, it's helps to sleep at night when you come to terms with the forgiveness that god offers you and you seek it you confess you repent and you say lord let me rest now let me have the peace the hope the presence the confidence and the experience of your love found in romans chapter 5 I'm going to close with this story. You see, freedom is realized through believing. Freedom is realized through believing. Once the emperor of Russia had a plan by which he was to liberate the peasants of that country, there were 40 millions of them. Of some of them, their whole time was sold. Of others, only a part. The emperor called around his council and wanted to have them devise some way to set them free. After they had conferred and considered it for half a year, one at the council sent in their decision, sealed, that they thought it was not expedient to free the peasants. Many of them may have held the debt that the peasants had. But the emperor went down to the Greek church that night and partook of the Lord's Supper. And he set his house in order. And the next morning, you could hear the tramp of soldiers in the streets of St. Petersburg. The emperor summoned his guard, and before noon, 65,000 men were surrounding that palace. And just at midnight, they came out a proclamation that every servant in Russia was forever set free. Every slave was forever set free. The proclamation had gone forth, and all the slaves of the realm believed it. They have been free ever since. Now, suppose they had not believed it. Never then would have gotten the benefit of the freedom. You see, obedience is faith that is energized by love, but works is belief that is energized by fear. We've got to take our belief from that works level and that fear level to the faith level that is energized by love. Is that your desire today, friends? To have a faith and have an obedience that is energized by the love of God, the un matched power, the unquenchable power of God's love. I invite you to bow your heads with me today and pray. Loving God in heaven, as we understand these scriptures and hold them to be true, we claim that promise. We ask for your forgiveness today, dear Lord, and may we experience your love. May we experience your love from you and from our church family, dear Lord, we pray in Jesus' wonderful and precious name. Amen. God bless you, friends. We will be having work be tomorrow to improve our curb appeal of our church. We we'll look forward to seeing you when we can. God bless you. Remember, wear your mask, wash your hands, and stay as physically distant as possible when it's not possible to, to um, be when, when it's being a crowd. And as you know, we are in a stay-at-home order at this time, but we will be having outdoor church at Woodside. God bless you, friends.